Here now is Faith to Live By with Pastor Barber. In Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 2, we read, O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known in wrath, remember mercy. Here is the male quartet to sing, Revive Us Again. The Bible has the answer. You have provided the questions and we search God's holy word, the Bible, in order to find the answers. Question number one. First Samuel chapter 18, verse 10. An evil spirit from God. There are just as many believers today who are troubled by this verse as Saul, King Saul was very many 3,000 years ago by that evil spirit. What is taking place here? We read now, it came about that on the next day, an evil spirit from God came mightily upon Saul and he raved in the midst of the house while David was playing the harp with his hand as usual and a spear was in Saul's hand and Saul flings that spear at David seeking to kill him. We come and we consider that, first of all, King Saul had sinned away his privilege. He had sinned away. He had played with holy things. He had elevated himself, and he was outside of God's grace at this time. He had, uh, he had frittered away, you could say, his privilege and his place, although God kindly allowed him to remain king for a time yet. An evil spirit is sent from God. What are we to do with that? Does God have a, a, a storehouse of evil spirits which go out to do his bidding? I want to take you to two passages, both of them in Job, Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2. Job 1 verse 6 says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And that same thing is stated again 
in chapter 2, verse 1, that the sons of God came to present themselves, and Satan, the deceiver, comes. It emphasizes to us that God rules over all. And as the devil, as Satan, accuses the Lord and accuses Job, saying, look, you guys, uh, you're being too nice to Job. That's why he serves you. And God says, all right, that hedge which you imagine me to have round about him, and in fact, there was a hedge. God was not allowing Satan to get close to Job. He says, all right, you can get a little closer, and then you can get a little closer yet. First of all, taking away his family and all of his goods, and then taking away his health, yet Job retained his integrity and did not curse God. Here we have it, the sovereignty of God. It emphasizes that God rules over all, and even the demons are under his restraining power. The Bible is not a cosmic book of wondering whether God will win or whether evil will win. There is absolutely no doubt who will win and who carries the day. But God, he allows the devil to do what he does. He allows and allowed that evil spirit to come upon Saul, but it was for a purpose and God was carrying out his plan, and he protected his servant David. And David, just as God promised to him, he did in fact become king at the appointed time. God rules over all. Understand that, and that no power can get close to you except that God is still holding the leash, and that they shall not come anywhere near to you beyond what God determines. Question number two. In heaven, will we recognize parents, spouse, siblings, and friends? Frequently we answer this question, and I think it's time for us to give the answer once again, because it is something that weighs heavy upon many hearts in glory. Are we going to be identification less? Are we going to be unknown? Are we going to lose our identifying qualities which come to us from this world? Yes, indeed, they will be redeemed. We will be cleansed. There will be nothing unclean in that perfect place. But will that mean that we will lose our identity and will others in like manner lose theirs so that we really don't know who they are. We're just some faceless crowd in heaven worshiping round the throne of God. I submit to you that in heaven we are not less aware, we are not less intelligent than we are on this earth. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, the love chapter, Paul says, Now we see in a mirror dimly, then face to face. Now I know in part, my knowledge is limited, but then I will fully know just as I have been fully known. And also in Revelation chapter 21 and chapter 22, Heaven will not be a place of knowledge being hindered, but rather of knowledge being much greater. And the awareness that we have, we will have much more of it than we have ever had before. I leave you to read in Revelation chapters 21 and 22 of the glories of heaven. And especially in chapter 21 and verse 3, where it says, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. Then verse 4, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. What? blinds our eyes? What limits our sight? What causes confusion? I submit to you that tears and death and mourning and crying and pain, 
These are things which inhibit, these are things which limit our senses from being at their fullest capacity. In that glorious land, God will take away all of those things and we will know even as we are known. Dear friends, you'll know your parents, you'll know your siblings, whether you want to know them or not, that's another matter. You'll know your spouse, you'll know your kids, and it will be glory, and we will dwell there for all eternity because of what Christ Jesus did for us upon Calvary's cross, the shedding of, our, of his blood for our sin. That will be glory indeed. Thank you for these questions. If you have a question, send it to us. We will use it as we are able. Our mailing address, Faith to Live By, Box 426, Winnipeg, Manitoba, R3C2H6. The full group now comes to sing, We'll Understand It Better by and by. And then I'm joined by Lois and Jan as we sing, How Beautiful Heaven Must Be.
read in the Gospels that as Jesus taught, the common people would gladly listen to him. They would get up early in the morning to hear the Master's gracious words. A key part of their eager interest was because of the parables Jesus gave. More than 10 years ago, Pastor H. H. Barber preached a series of 22 Faith to Live By sermons from the parables. These messages have been printed in the book, A Certain Man Had Two Sons. This book includes a bonus CD of many of the parables being read from the King James Version by Jim Barber. You will enjoy digging into the parables with this helpful resource. Ask for your free copy of Two Sons with the bonus CD when you write this week to Faith to Live By, Box 426, Winnipeg, Manitoba, R3C2H6, or call toll-free 1-833-367-3877. Or visit faithtoliveby.ca. This book, Two Sons and the Bonus CD, is sent free and postage paid and is yours simply for the asking. May it be used of God to help you grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our wonderful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Rick Bowring now sings Nearing the Shore. The great question that every one of us must ask, what think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? In another way, the people back 2,000 years ago as Jesus ministered among them, both to the, to the disciples and to the crowds, they wondered, what manner of man is this? I submit to you that Jesus is the master whose voice we must heed. For we see in the earliest ministry of Jesus, how the, the disciples responded to his call. I take you to both Luke chapters 5 and 6 as we consider how that Jesus gathered around him 12 men 
who would walk with him and to whom Jesus would invest in a most particular way. Luke chapter 5, and this is also in the other gospel accounts, we read of how that Jesus was one day by the lake of Gennesaret, that is also the name for the Sea of Galilee, and there were two fishing boats lying by the edge of the lake. The fishermen had gotten out and were washing their nets. Jesus gets in to one of the boats, which was Simon's, and he asked that it be put out from the shore just a little way, that he might teach the people, and this he did. But when he was done, he speaks to Simon, to Simon Peter, and he says, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Jesus was going to be no man's debtor. He was going to pay for the rental, for the time of that, for the use of Simon's boat. Simon answered him and said, Master, we have worked hard all night and caught nothing, but I will do as you say and let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed what is called a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break. They could not contain the haul that they caught that day, and they signaled to their partners in another boat, and they come, and they filled both of the boats, so much so they began to sink. And when Simon saw what had taken place, he speaks to Jesus and he says, depart from me. He says, go away, Lord. I'm a sinful man. I don't deserve your goodness. I don't deserve what you have come to bring. And for amazement had seized him and all of his companions. This is the man who Jesus was. He spoke to the crowds and after he had taught them, they were amazed at him. Jesus works this miracle. He brings these fish from every part of the Sea of Galilee, those fish that had escaped those very nets all through the night. Now they come and they gather themselves into those nets so that the boats begin to sink under the load of them all. But Peter says, I'm a sinful man, O Lord. Please go away from me. I don't deserve mercy. I don't deserve your kindness. Amazement had seized him and all of his companions because of the catch of fish. And so it was with James and John, their working buddies. But Jesus said to Simon, do not fear, from now on you will be catching men. Jesus spoke to him about being a fisher of men. Jesus spoke, the master spoke. The master voiced his call, and Peter and Andrew, his brother, and James and John, they all re responded to the call of the master. It says, when they brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Now go further along to verse 27 of Luke chapter 5. After that, he went out and noticed a tax collector named Levi sitting in the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. This intrigues me. Jesus walks up to this man with all of his ledgers and with all of his coinage round about him, with all of his responsibilities, perhaps having many assistants. Jesus, the authority, Jesus, the voice that we must heed, he walks up to that table in the middle of the day, perhaps with a line of people waiting to pay their taxes. Jesus says, Levi, Matthew, you come with me. We've got greater things to do. And it says he left everything behind and got up and began to follow him. Levi would have a reception at which he would gather together many of his friends and they would hear of Jesus and the wonder that he is. Jesus is the one whose voice we must heed. Have you heeded the voice of the master? I bid you to come to him today. He is the one who can forgive, pardon, cleanse. He is the one who can make all that is wrong in your life right. He is the one to whom we ought to surrender. He is the very Son of God, come as the Son of Man. Would you come and hear his voice 
calling you today. watch for Faith to Live By again next Sunday at this same time on this same station. Until then, Faith to Live By prays that the peace of God will fill your heart and that the joy of the Lord will be your strength. Pastor Barber would love to hear from you. The mailing address is Faith to Live By, Box 426, Winnipeg, Manitoba, R3C2H6. 